Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's event. Um, tonight, we have a very exciting event. We have Nicole Glover here, who is the author of The Conductors, um, a wonderful new novel that you know, we're very excited about here at uh, Mysterious Galaxy. Uh, Nicole works as a UX researcher. She's in Virginia, and she believes libraries are magical places because they are, and that's where all the books live and the lovely words live. Um, Sorry, brain. <laughs> um, the Conductors is her debut novel, and we are so excited about it here. Um, and she is joined tonight by John Joseph Adams, who is the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, um, and you know has edited several anthologies. So he has is our gracious conversation partner tonight. Um, as I said, my name is Jenny. I'm going to give my little spiel, and then you know you're not here to talk to me and I will pass it off to our lovely guests. Um, for those of you who have been to Crowdcast before, I'd like it's a real place, uh, you will see the comment section in the right-hand side. Um, and that's where you know we just share all the lovely love that's going around. Uh, if you have any questions for our authors, you wanna look down below, there's an ask a question button, and that's where you can type in anything you'd like our um, authors to answer. And you can also upvote any questions that you want to make sure we get answered. So if there's, you know, a question that you're dying to hear the answer of, make sure to mark it. Um, you can also find the buy book button below hand. Uh, that is where you can purchase the conductors and you can also get a signed and personalized book plate. Um, so check it out if you haven't yet. And I am, I, obviously, I'm the queen of transitions. This is hmm. you know, my calling. I am going to give it up to our lovely panelists and pass it off to John. So have fun, and I will see you. Already, thank you, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, I just want to address that uh, our, our friend Matthew here. Uh, thank you for uh, clarifying, Matthew, that your, your your comment was your your question was actually more of a comment. Uh, co you know, which is like the sort of uh, uh, joke in uh, convention circles where people in the audience say, "It's like, oh well, what I they ask they go to ask a question, and it turns out to be not actually a question but a comment." But but, but we forgive you, Matthew. Um, so uh, hello, Nicole, and um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and uh, I should say one, uh, one further tidbit about me that is uh, at least somewhat relevant to this conversation. I'm also Nicole's editor. Uh, I, I acquired this book for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and I edited it. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's why I'm here. Um, uh, but, uh, and uh, so Nicole, um, how, how have, how's the day been going for you so far? Have you been looking forward to this? Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's a nice nice way to end a, a long day of like busy work and other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just before we dive right into the conductors, I mean, I know like your bio is right in front of me, and it, and it says that one of your uh, interests is video games. Uh, what what are what are the video games like you're super into right now? I'm just I've just been playing Hades for like the past I don't know four months now or so. Mm -hmm. It's I mean it's a masterclass of the UX design. And game design and very well crafted. And I keep pitching it and propping it up every time I, people ask about it because it's it's all been playing <laughs> and so much I haven't bought any of the new games in a while. I know I'm not going to touch them. Right, right. Uh, all right. Well, uh, uh, people came here to hear about the conductors, so uh, let's talk about that. Um, so uh, you know, uh, it's. Uh, just to give people a little overview, uh, so it's uh, about uh, two two people who were uh, formerly uh, conductors on the, uh, uh, they were conductors on the Underground Railroad. And uh, now it uh, takes place in just a couple of years after the end of the Civil War. And they're now living in Philadelphia and they're investigating mysteries and solving problems and that kind of thing. Um, and there's all kinds of magic and uh, nefarious deeds being done that uh, Hedy and Benji have to, um, you know, uh, you know, figure out and, and bring the bring the ne'er do wells to justice and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, so, why don't we just start with uh, how did you first come up with the inspiration to write this book? Like, where did this idea come from to 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 marry um, you know uh, these fantasy tropes to uh, these un people who were uh, conductors on the Underground Railroad? I, and it came from diff uh, the idea itself. This came from me just having different ideas for different stories. I had it was. Conductor started as straight historical fiction. I have always liked 
the history on the ground railroad and i liked and was interested like with the reconstruction era and all those different things and but it was just an idea i had that didn't really go anywhere until i decided to add magic to, magic to it one day mm-hmm. and you know once i had magic in there i had an idea what the story is going to go and the mystery element just kind of slid into place like mm-hmm. just it's like magic so to speak <laughs> and yes yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of different ideas that came together. Like it's all my good ideas come come together that way. Just just different ideas I just combined and mixed together. It's kind of see like like what ifs basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and were there any specific uh, like historical uh, you know sort of people that you came across that inspired any of the characters or anything like that? Yeah, a lot. I it's, through all my research, I came across just less profiles of just the people who living in and around Philadelphia. Just you know, teachers. Uh, the people, the people who've made efforts in the community and this all those just interesting people interesting lives that I kind of got inspired some of the characters especially the secondary characters even they aren't they aren't like based off the real people I just kind of I just saw things that looked interesting and I wanted to incorporate and make sh- and have these part of the characters in the story mm-hmm um, and then, uh, so Philadelphia, obviously, is a very important city in the history of, of America, and particularly at that time period. Uh, but uh, why did you decide to set the story in Philadelphia specifically? Well, there's lots of different reasons. All the research I did has always kind of led me in some way in Philadelphia. A lot of it, it was a big, it was a big thing, a big stop on the Underground Railroad back in the, mm-hmm. during that time period. It had a lot of it had a it had a large free black population before the Civil War, so it's a it really a, a settled community there that's been built up for just like several a few generations that had left deep roots, and it was just seen in a lot of the community organizations from like churches to mutual aid societies to all this social stuff they had already in there. So it was like a rich kind of it was a rich setting to kind of build into it. And I think other ways and other other things is also like a little Easter and my nod to my I loved the American Girl series Addie that I read back in day when I was a kid and that was set in Philadelphia mm. and a little bit a few years after some of the time period. So that's like a little Easter egg nod to that series, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. Okay. Um, and then, um, so you know, one of the things I thought was really interesting in the book is how, uh, you know, the, the, the main storyline takes place in like, 1871 and then but then periodically throughout the book there's a couple of interludes that take place several years earlier um and uh so those interludes take place when hetty and benji are actually doing the work on the underground railroad as opposed to being after uh what like the most like the rest of the story uh were those sections always uh in there like when you first were conceiving of everything um or uh is that something that just came along that uh you incorporated later on and um uh, and and like what what uh uh did, what what about it that you what 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 was it about that that made, it felt like super important to include those in the book I think uh, a lot of the interludes kind of got set up was like I wanted to show off some of some of their past to go to their backstory, but I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't just dropping these sections of that of like flashbacks within the book itself. Since there, I I am as big about the, the the show versus tell thing. I didn't want to just like you know, I these are I, I, there's enough interesting things. I didn't just want to flat out tell people in the story, but I wanted to kind of show some of it and do a little telling and mixing it in there. And so I figured the interludes were like the best way to kind of naturally allow me to have some space to kind of expand on these moments because just telling some of these okay, I can summarize these sections, but It'd be more interesting to kind of know, like, experience reading it wise. So it was, so for me, it was like a, it was for me, it was like a challenge to make them kind of like a short story in a sense with these interludes and kind of just give a moment. And I worked really hard to think about making sure it was relevant to the story, make sure it tied back to the main event. It tied back to at least one of the different subplots. So it basically told you something that you couldn't get in the main story or it kind of explain or illuminate stuff in the main storyline. And and as I found that it wasn't, if it was there were a couple of times in my revisions, I was some of them became more indulgent. I actually cut cut those out when I realized I looked at they don't they aren't fitting my criteria for certain things. I want to make sure I want to make sure it was relevant. And I think one of them ends up being I think I originally had five. I ended up wanting adding one extra one in there just to flush out certain things in there. But it was idea of these spaces, even though the, the contents of them changed during revision. They're always kind of there because I felt these are spaces I want to explain certain things, especially since the book itself takes place, the main storyline takes place within a week. So I don't have all the time to show up all the backstory and history. So the interludes got me, it gave me some some space for certain things. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and so uh, one of the really interesting elements of the book, I think, is the whole magic system that you developed that that, uh, you know, well, because there's multiple magic systems, actually. And so uh, you, you want to just talk a little bit about those, um, you know, describe the different ones like, you know, so there's a constellation based one and then but then there's the other ones as well. You want to just talk about what they are and how they're different from each other. Um, and then we can talk more about it after that. Yeah. Yeah, with the magic systems, I I mean, I started off thinking like, what kind of magic, what kind of magic I want to work with in the book? It's I started off that question of things that were interesting to me. What, what, what kind of magic do I want my main characters to do? And I guess when I decided to craft the magic system was like, I like astronomy, I like stars, I'm gonna do something with constellations. And then I read some stuff about like, you know, sigils and like, you know, I could do like a mixed constellation, like star sigils basically. And it kind of went from there. And I started as I, as I wrote, I kind of just imagined this, the fun ways I could twist and use different magic. And as I was building out the magic system from the main characters, I was I got started me thinking about how magic itself works within the world. And I guess one of my I guess one of my things is that I always like the idea of of, of stories where the, everyone can have magic. Because you read so many stories about it's always limited to certain groups of people. Like there's or it's, it's either a secret group or certain people certain bloodlines or some people can only learn it and all those different things. And I was interested in seeing what the world of if everyone can do magic looks like. And as I got thinking about that and thinking about what my what kind of magic the character's going to be using, I started thinking like, well, everyone has different types of magic based on you know their different backgrounds, their their history, their nation, nationals, their nationalities, their ethnicities, and all those other things like that. So I kind of built out that way because I saw, I guess, in some ways, I kind of viewed magic as like you know it's a craft, it's an art skill, and everyone like there's different art styles out there in the world. Like you can paint, you can sculpt, and so I kind of went with that the way that can, that's my approach to magic, and so. I started thinking like, you know, this is the celestial magic. It's going to be what my main character has been doing it, been using. So what's the other types of magic out there? And I settled as a big contrast being sorcery, the, the typical like wand waving enchantments, things where you're kind of used to used to seeing as magic and having that as a big contrast for different reasons, eating that the sorcery being more like a strict by the rules. It's more, it's stiffer. So it's a big, a good contrast to celestial magic, which was like very organic coming from nature since it's inspired by the stars. And from those, those it makes those that makes it a big contrast, especially as I, I, I tied sorcery in with a lot of the the Western Europeans, the basically it's the white people magic basically, mm -hmm. and tie that into like the, tie it further into all the the, the the history of the world, the the the, uh, the realization of the world as I, because I mirrored the uh, like the, like some I drew from history like things like a uh, like different gun gun laws that came out that time period saying that like you know certain people are allowed to use magic and white people basically can use magic use use wands so I tie that into like the to the contrast with further into the sorcery and whatnot and I also and as further world bank world building stuff I left with the idea that since every there's other magic systems out in the world even though I don't necessarily describe them and kind of hints at there's you know there's other different from the pockets around the world, though, you would expect different magic systems to show up because it's magic. Everyone can do magic. It's just interpreted differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting the way, uh, you know, you, you like you were just saying where where, uh, you know, only certain people were allowed to use wands. And so like it's actually like against the law and everything. And so mm -hmm. it's like uh, uh, it really highlighted the sort of uh, the different uh, um, uh there's sort of different realities that people can live in, you know, and, and like how even uh, even after the end of the war, it's like there's still all these different inequities, people finding other yeah. ways to have these inequities beyond just mm -hmm. all the other ones that we all know about from actual history. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, so when uh, you were conceiving of the different uh, magic mm. things, were, were were there any uh, particular spells or anything that like you were just really the most fond of or or like, like one of the sigils or anything. Like I know Hetty uh, seems to have her her own favorite ones that mm -hmm. she pulls out uh, more often than mm -hmm. not. But uh, I wondered if there was one that um, you know st stood out in your mind as like you know just felt like the coolest thing that you thought of. Uh, I think I noticed I do a lot of magic that it involves things floating around. I mm -hmm. think it's mostly because I like mostly like papers and books. Mostly because that's what I really want to happen in real life. I want to have a spell <laughs> that allows yeah. me to have books. And all the papers, I'm like, it's floating around me, so I don't have right. to have like be like an octopus with different hands. It can just float, float around. So I think that shows up a lot in my, in, my, in, my, in the book and in general when I'm writing and stuff. Because I, I like that's what I like the idea. And it's like you know simple stuff that is like 
I guess this makes lives easier. Like I like the whimsy of like magic being in the background doing mundane stuff. I think I like this. I think I had a small scene where I had like, you know, the magic was using the store a pot on the stove and like, you know, the things like, like this adding a little like stuff into the mon using magic for more, but we seem as mund mundane stuff, mm -hmm. but this is whimsical things. Mm -hmm. things I like that. Like, right. Uh, yeah. And one of the other things that uh, it, you, you have in there as well is you also have like this idea of just alchemy, like, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the characters uh, makes potions and things like that, and so it's like uh, it's it's not quite the it's not quite as uh, it doesn't seem quite as powerful as like the magic that's in the book. Mm. But it's interesting that uh, you know you have these other people who are who aren't doing like regular magic on that level, mm. but they but you know they're doing their own little types of magic, yeah. uh, and and a lot of it's uh, yeah. It, uh, did you did you do research into like actual alchemy and that kind of thing or, or herbalism or did you just kind of uh, go with uh, 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 fanciful stuff to to uh, that you just thought would be cool? <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I guess I didn't do too much research. I guess it's because those are things that always interested me in the past. I think I'd done like I had like a base level of you know interest of it. I think I was. I get a sense like you know I think I think I remember I read a couple of books about like certain herbs like mm -hmm. herbs. That people like magical herbs or like people mm -hmm. that use for that sort of thing. Because most of that stuff, it's, it just interested me. I felt mm -hmm. like reading it one time, just seeing what kind of what, what they are. I think I remembered reading a book about different poisons. I did a lot of mm -hmm. kind of research like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it was an interesting time when I was when I all excited to pull all different stuff of research. Right. And I remember reading a bunch of things like that and deciding like, you know, should I involve real stuff? Should I get make up my my own like little plants for this sort of, mm -hmm. sort of thing? And sometimes that shows up because it's easier to make up with plants so you can figure out what kind of ailments they can do without worrying about real life stuff. And so mm -hmm. Uh, so one one thing I, I thought was really well done in the book was this uh, very complex relationship between Hetty and Benji. It's like they have this kind of marriage of convenience at the start, but then it, it kind of grows and develops as the book progresses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's like some like I actually just got chills thinking about some of the scenes mm -hmm. just now, like mm -hmm. which I think is always a good sign, you know. Mm -hmm. But like there's there's just some moments that are just like really wonderful, like as the book yeah. progresses. And and um, I guess I just wondered, like, did you did you again, like, did you always have that in mind to have that kind of very complicated relationship between these two characters, uh, or did that sort of develop organically as you were telling the story and you just kind of had to figure out ways to add different tension mm -hmm. and different moments and everything, and that was how you ended up doing it. Uh, so, yeah. I think it's, it was me, I think that's, they start, I had the idea that there always were a couple from the beginning. They came, and the story came to me as them being like, you know, a couple of partners married already. But as, as, as I just, I guess as I got more there in the book, I feel, that's when I started to find like what the relationship's like. And I was thinking about like, well, it's also of all those, also their personalities and how other, their other arcs and other things like that. I think it started to, it felt like, a, felt like just starting from a marriage convenience, the sense was, a good place. I mean, it's one of my favorite tropes to read about, and when I read like romances and other like romantic comedies, all the stories like that as well. Because it's I think it's something fun about being people that are that together, and in this case, they get on pretty pretty well. And it's just the relationship just changes that unexpectedly, and it's just fun to kind of exploring that as as, as a writer and a reader in a sense. And it's yeah, it's one of those things I just kind of just just developed as I just started really thinking about the characters themselves. How they worked it separately, how they were together, and it just it felt it felt really well, and it made a nice nice contrast to what was going on. It made work thematically too, because I like the idea because the made the big conceit of the book is that the death of the friend like changes so many things in their lives, and having the relationship being another one of those things just felt like a natural fit. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, you know the the. Although the novel is a fantasy novel, it's obviously also a mystery novel, and um. Uh, so I think one of the challenges a lot of people have when they're trying to write a, a science fiction fantasy book, mm. when they want to have that strong mystery plot as the main plot, uh, mm. is that, uh, you know, maybe they don't know the, the um, conventions of a mystery uh, mm. as well as they know the conventions of a science mm. fiction fantasy novel. Although, obviously, a, a lot of things have a mystery mm. plot line right. to it or backbone. Uh, but... Uh, did you did you come from like they had you read tons of mysteries growing up and like it was always a, a sort of uh, interest of yours or uh, 
did you have to do a bunch of research to do it uh, to to make the plot work? Because I mean, that was like one of the things. Like I feel like I hardly touched it all when we were, when I was editing it. Is like, no, you had you had the plot. Like that was that was yes. there. You know. Yeah. So uh, so I, I was just wondering, uh, like how far how far do you go back with mysteries and all that? Yeah, it's I'm I read a ton of mysteries growing up. I think I read I'm a I'm a big bookworm, so I have read like across different genres all the, all the way. So. And I think I, I think I had a phase where I was in really into all the the classic mystery stuff like Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes stuff and I'm like I didn't see anything that was kind of mystery related. I think even my like first stories as a kid were like mysteries for some mm -hmm. odd reason. So I guess it made sense that I got older. My first one, my big my big stories would be a mystery. Yeah. So I'm yeah. So the mystery conventions, uh, figuring out the, the plots, who done it, you know, all this stuff. So the things that I really loved about Clue, both mm -hmm. the game and like the, the the movie and stuff were all things I was really into. So. It wasn't too hard. It's just more of just yeah, just making sure it make it all make it all work together. See, I didn't I didn't really feel like I had to do too much other than just I think I just did like maybe I mean I might have just added some more mysteries to my like my reading rotation just to get familiar with certain things. Cause it's cause sometimes I go through phases like I'll read more fantasy and science fiction mm -hmm. and switch with genres and stuff like that. But yeah, I didn't really feel like I did too much. Didn't have to do too much other than cursory like just mm -hmm. brushing up so to speak and just. And just kind of checking in on certain like certain tropes or things, or even more like looking at what tropes I wanted to include when mm -hmm. solving this, when uh, building up a mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as far as uh, the the sort of um, the historical aspect of mm -hmm. having a mystery plot, like did that cause you any difficulties, like when you were conceiving of different uh, elements of the mystery, which I'm trying to be vague about so I don't give anything mm -hmm. away. But uh, when you're conceiving of all the different elements, like did did you ever bump up against like the historical reality of what was possible at this time period versus like what you had originally thought. And then like you had to change gears to be like, Oh, no, wait, <laughs> they won't be able to figure that out very easily because of the time period and anything like that happen. Um, not really. I think cause I did some fair amount of historical research that I got into it. I at least had a sense of like, well, I'm not like, I, I think I knew stuff like, you know, thing, like fingerprinting and stuff wasn't like a big, big, big deal around that time, but I think it came a little bit later. So things I kind of knew, stuff I kind of came across in previous research, I kind of knew already. So I didn't have to worry about like certain things. I think in some cases I would use, I guess for like certain methods, like for methods for movie magic of, of mystery solving, I kind of leaned on the magic element using the magic as the tool to kind of help with like the methods of mystery solving. Mm -hmm. And a lot of some, and I think a lot of the historical stuff, it's some, some components of mystery actually was inspired by some historical aspects I found in my research that kind of, Kind of organically, kind of got built in as I was building up the mystery and like tweaking out stuff and all this other all that stuff together. So I, yeah, I think I think that's the answer to the question. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, actually, um, that just that that makes me think. Uh, you know, in terms of like uh, having having the the magic elements or the fantastical mm -hmm. elements uh, help with the solving of the mystery, mm -hmm. that that poses a real challenge to a writer a lot of times. Is that well when you have the power of mm -hmm. all these magical powers, mm -hmm. how can you have the, 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 you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the real mystery elements mm -hmm. there not get taken away because, well, they have magic, you know? And so, mm -hmm. uh, how, how much of a juggling act did you feel like that was as you were going along? It's, I mean, I guess at a certain point, it's like you, you have to think like, well, uh, it's already established that they can do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And so like, then like, you got to, think about mm -hmm. all the implications going all the way down the line in terms of like oh well but they can't mm -hmm. be able they can't do that because they can't mm -hmm. do x because later on that would make things too easy you know so did you run into anything any challenges like that or anything or and i think it's i think i was like building up how i wanted the magic to work in the world i think i had it since i i think it was mostly as a tool to help them certain things mm -hmm. So it wasn't so it wasn't like the math the magic is going to tell them who the murderer was basically mm -hmm. or you know really like you know like really kind of lean, lean enough, uh, make it really clear in that fashion. So I think I, since I use it as a tool, like way to discover, to figure out what's going on, you know, figure out, you know, what kind of magic was done in this place or X, Y, mm -hmm. that certain things like that. I think that kind of, that's, I probably, that, that because I took that approach, I think that made it easier for me to not, or at least made it for me not to be too worried that I was uh, just using magic as a shortcut with the mystery mm -hmm. or just making it scenes like that. And I think I also try to, I think I also try to set within like uh, rules within the world itself. So pe so the reader would kind of anticipate that magic wouldn't be able to help them this way or make it because they kind of clear, make the characters like, you know, comment or observe, oh, this magic will be not helpful for this, this, this thing because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And I think, 
I think kind of establishing that kind of helps me not think like, you know, make magic the shortcut, make the easy way out for the, out mm-hmm. of the mystery. So it's, it's, yeah, it's like, that's always the big, it's always the big concern because you don't want to make it make the mystery too easy, mm-hmm. especially when it's, there, there's a, it's an easy solution with magic. Right. Um, and uh, just getting uh, back a minute to uh, uh, my earlier question about historical uh, stuff in the mysteries. Uh, when you were doing all your different historical research, um, did you uh, w- was there anything that just like really surprised you that you discovered uh, during the course of the research? Like whether it's about uh, the city of Philadelphia or about the Underground Railroad or, or anything like that. Was there anything just like completely took you by surprise or that you just thought was really interesting that you had you know hadn't known before? Oh, there's just so many different things that kind of came up. I think, and I was, I was, I guess I was really interested by all the mutual aid societies that had, had cropped up in Philadelphia at that time period. It made sense because they had as a since it was a strong community. But it's, I guess it's, I just, I started thinking in the scope of they are and like in modern day, like all the other uh, community aid groups that are out and about now these days. It makes sense that back in the day they had all these these like these organizations like kind of built up and were growing for a while. So that was interesting to me of all that stuff, as well as all the social stuff going on, all the excursions that they did back in the day. Some of them tied to churches and oh, I'm learning about like political clubs that they had, mm-hmm. which was kind of fascinating. More because in the sense that like, you know, the clubs in the sense that they're like, you know, this, sometimes there's people hanging out, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> doing stuff or they actually are doing work like politically organizing or organizing, organizing because it was a big deal, especially for the black populations, but since the, since the book itself, the book takes place right after the it was the amendment passed for voting for voting rights, so it was a very important thing. And just re- learning, reading all this stuff about how so things that we had, that's like coming that's that's ordinary to me these days was really important to them back in the day. It was just kind of fascinating to kind of read about. And then there's like just different tidbits I learned about as I did more deeper research in the Ground Railroad. I think I've always been amused. I was amused that the, the whole the quilt thing is not a myth; it's a myth basically. That the, there's there is not there's little evidence saying that the quilts had secret messages that were held out in front of the cabins. Mm-hmm. Like you know, it's like kind of mythicized the things that are kind of brought that was kind of it's fun to talk about, but it's probably little limited cases of what was actually happening. It's finding things out like that and 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 and, and, and it's coming on with the underground railroad, realizing that the underground railroad went two ways. It didn't just go north; it went south into Mexico, went down into the Caribbeans and all this other stuff, and just thinking of different just. It's different in the scope of certain things and thinking and learning it's more it's more fractured it wasn't like a a tightly run like organization going from north to south basically it was just like more localized you'll mm-hmm. see that's why you see a lot, a lot of places like around the ohio border or like around the virginia maryland and philadelphia area like it was all basically a lot of this place were localized it wasn't really like a far stretching out thing because it because you know they didn't have you know they didn't have the internet back then, so they had to you know ride the, the close connections and letters and you know all the time delays and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one one element of the book that I think is uh, very strong is uh, uh, this sort of uh, heady or. or uh, I don't know if I, I guess the my question is uh, is this uh, authorial interest or or did it did it just feel like it was particularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, vital for the setting to establish details, but, uh, you know, Hetty is a seamstress, and uh, there's, like, you know, there's a lot of uh, focus on, like, the different um, uh, you know, styles and fashions of the era, Um, and I know when we were talking about the cover and everything, you had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, uh, details that you thought were important to reflect everything, which I think uh, turned out great, you know, and I was so thankful that you had that clear vision, uh, because, like, it helped us get this a great cover uh but uh so i mean was that just a, an interest of yours that that you wanted to put in there or was it like really um a, a, a very important thing of that era that like if it didn't have that element in the book that it would have uh felt like bland or something because it wasn't that vital element in there i think on one level i looked at character i mean she's a dressmaker so I'm like she's mm-hmm. gonna have to notice dresses like she makes sure. she does all the time she takes pride in her like, her craft so i'm like she has to make note notice of like everyone's clothes and have opinions on that and so i think that was that was my that was my first uh, thought with this with all the talk about the clothes another another level is that i guess i wanted to help get make it kind of clear this is the time period mm-hmm. help you know give the the sense that it was historical like you know just mentioning certain clothes would kind of helps with mm-hmm. that and I think I was, I went back in college for fun. I took a fashion history class. Oh. And then I think it, it got me interested in how 
clothing, uh, you know, interacts as it's how just important clothing is. And, and like, it's enough that it's, I can start like pick out, you can pick out certain time periods. I look at photos and I think, I think when I was doing like a, I guess I did a, a Pinterest board and I was writing the books. And I actually got really good at picking out like what's like 1870s versus 1890s versus mm -hmm. all this other stuff. Cause I, like, I started to figure out like, you know, the, where, the, where the clothes were, like the sleeves and the collars, mm -hmm. the, the full dress and everything, like even the hairstyles and stuff like that. Really good, really was well looking at photos. And I think that's, I think it's important it's to kind of bring it in there. Cause it's a, it all that, it all that it's all those things that makes it historical, makes it feel real and stuff like that. It makes it a difference. And I mean, I make, I, like in a sense, I made a choice making historical because I set this in modern day. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think it's, it's important like to bring certain details like that and just to just make, make people aware. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, uh, I think we're uh, at the half hour mark of our uh, discussion. So it might be mm -hmm. time to turn it over to the uh, questions of, from the audience. Uh, so let's see what uh, our first question is. Um, oh, well, here, here's one that kind of goes a little bit further than the question I asked earlier, which was, what is the most interesting thing you discovered in your research that didn't make it into the book? Uh, that's from uh, Matthew Berger didn't make it into the book. Um, when I was looking into historical people back in the day, I think uh, one of the one of the ones that was like a, I think I found this stuff about Henry Box Brown. He had mailed, he's the guy who mailed himself in a box to Philadelphia to William Stoll's office and kind of inspired other people to do the same thing. But after that, he went on, he basically went around and toured in Europe and England. So kind of talking about abolitionist stuff and he also was like a magician for a period of time, which I was thought was really fascinating. And I actually found that bit by accident because I think I was reading up a book about this magician, stage magician at the time that came up. It's like, oh, he's a magician. And that's and I actually I think I actually did find randomly like a some uh, like a, a a magician like around these or you know, currently he did a an act and it's kinda of inspired by that, which I thought was really like a weird, like a fascinating thing. You know, I, my research was kinda of colliding with like, you know, something I randomly found, but Things like that, like other real person. I think I had like a, I think I, I found some research about it. Don, Donna Lewis, a sculpture of that time period. It, and I really wanted to make her a character in that book. And it is, there was no space for her. And so I had to cut her, sadly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, well, Matthew has a couple of questions here. So uh, here's another one. Um, what did, you, uh, what did you grow up reading to come up with such an interesting mix of genres blended together? Which I guess we kind of talked about that, but maybe you can give some specific, uh, <laughs> some specific examples. Um, and, then he, and then he followed up by saying, uh, what were the, uh, oh, it's moving around. Uh, hang on a second, I lost the question in the middle of it. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Uh, what were the challenges blending them all together? Um, okay. But yeah, I guess we could start with, uh, you know, some specific examples of your reading uh, when you were younger? So I, like I said, I've read a lot of books and I've read, for some reason, at that period of time, I was really interested in all those like historical books they had for like middle, like, middle school age kids. Like uh, they had these Dear America journal journal books. They had all the, like I said, I mentioned before, the American Girl, American Girl series and a bunch of other like historical stuff. So I, bench, I read a bunch, a bunch of these like lightweight historical, historical middle grade little books. And so, yeah, the things I had, so I got me interested in history that way. And like I said before, I mentioned a bunch of different mysteries. And I think I got, I think I had a period of time I did, I was like reading some historic, a lot of this, just straight historical mysteries for a bit. And it was a fantasy and science fiction, like just pretty much anything I get my hands on. I think I'm the person, I've read a lot of books from the li libraries, from both public library and school library. So I've read a lot of a bunch of like old books. And I think, I think, I think I want to say Tor.com had put out a list of like, uh, like much, book, like a hundred books of like to read recent, like about last week and stuff. And a bunch of like old stuff that people, mm -hmm. people have heard about. And mm -hmm. I was astonished about like, there was several books on there I had read, <laughs> like not like, you know, just cause they were in the old these little libraries. So I think, cause I've read a lot of these, I read up from books, a lot of uh, libraries, and I think like all the libraries just happen to have these old books in there. And it's, and it's yeah, just, just, just anything I got, I got my hands on, I kind of read, and this took inspiration of that, whether it's something I liked about it, something I wanted to write on my own, do differently, or just some things like some conspects or aspects of it, I just wanted to twist and do something different with it that hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. And I guess when it comes to blending stuff together, I think it's, I guess for me, it was just more of like, um, I saw the historical 
historical aspect of it is the base level of like this is like this is the world part the world building aspect of it so fit uh, the fit the box of historical stuff and and i think i mentioned before like i used to i feel that the, the, the fantasy the magic aspect of it, i use magic as like a tool as a craft a way to how i want it. basically I, I use it the way that how, how i want things interact with the world and so i kind of use that way that aspect of it into the mystery aspect of it and i don't know i just kind of blend, i guess it's like just blends together i think sometimes I'll lean more. This me sometimes it's just historical, just straight historical stuff. Other times I'll I'll do the blends of fantasy things, the things that leans on to like more of like my interest. You know, because I like the kind of magic. The magic part was really fun for me to write about in books. So sometimes I lean into that aspect of it. And the mystery element is just a I don't know, just those landings right there. I think it's just finding the balance of like what fits at what certain moments of the book. Like, because as even though some there are some parts of the book where all three of them will be like really tied tied closer together, and sometimes it just be like two of them will have like the most impact. And I think I think it just in general the historical aspect, of course, and by nature of it had ran through the entire book, but just certain things I focus more on certain aspects of the, at certain parts of the book. Hmm. All right. Uh, so our next question is uh, from our host, Mysterious Galaxy. Uh, uh, who was your favorite character to write, and why? Uh, and then also, did you base your characters on any any real people? Although I think you already said that uh, uh, you you took some inspiration, but didn't explicitly yeah. base right. So, but right. Uh, favorite character to write and why? Okay. Uh, the easy question to say it was Hetty. It was all mm -hmm. the way because I think I mean spend the most time in their heads. It's most she was the most fun to kind of just you know just to make certain whether she's like making snarky comments or just like commenting on certain things or you know so I made her. She's also a storyteller, so it was really fun to me, like her, her to be like, "Oh, you want to hear a story?" Basically, mm -hmm. a lot of times, I like is to have her go out, for, go out for certain ways like that. It was for her, for me, it was like it was really fun. I think of, I think it's like, and whenever I write characters, I always feel like there's there's always take certain part aspects of you as a writer into them. And I think Hetty's the part, like the the part of me that wants to be more like the the loud, the, the part that's like has all the things to say, all the comments, the people, you know, they might be might be a little bit ruder than usual, hmm. or just that sort of thing. She's the the outlet for that certain stuff, or it's the person to be more, like, you know, kind of act first and like do certain things, but still kind of think about it. So that sort of stuff. So in general, she was fun to write. Uh, but it's but to take the, that was the easy that's the easy answer. Like so, the mm -hmm. looking at the some, some dec secondary characters I had fun mm -hmm. writing was a lot of mostly a lot of her friends, like her her best friend in the book Penelope. It was enough. It was also kind of fun because she's the the foil to Hetty and more like she's more like a whimsical about certain things. She's more like sentimental or it's more easily flustered and she was a nice a nice she was fun to write about fun to write about and as a, a nice there's a nice contrast and i think i mentioned before like, a lot of the characters took inspiration from like just different things i came across with the book like uh like for example like a um one of like once like one of her like some of her friends were like became an artist because i had uh read, read about like, a lot of artists at that time period i think of one that one the cast was going to be a poet, but I rather I could one the poet was a at that time period was a Francis Harper who was a teacher who was a a big a community activist and that became some aspect of that in one of the different characters and so a lot of real people kind of inspire certain things and this or sometimes just in general sometimes it was like learning histories about like the the Civil War soldiers and uh, how there are different rules about certain things like that I was learning reading about like a spy I think Mary Bowser for example had some aspects of that I think. And another another real life person that took some aspects that actually was help uh, inspire the part of Teddy was like Elizabeth Keckley was a he was a seamstress a dressmaker for uh, for Mrs Mrs Lincoln and uh, Mrs Lincoln and I think Miss and Mrs Davis too at the same realm from that same time period he was the idea of the dressmaker was like kind of went into heading in that aspect of it mm. and I think it and there's a lot of, just a lot of things like that just like just interesting people that I feel like one that in, it's like imbued certain qualities into the characters and secondary cast. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and then uh, here's another one from Mysterious Galaxy. Uh, so how do you balance your time uh, for writing uh, with uh, your day job as a UX researcher? Uh, and then can you talk about your writing process? Yeah. I basically write at night. I, I just, I, Sometimes I, when I was when I was when I was still in the office, I would spend lunch breaks uh, to go for a walk. I'd take some time to go to the, go to the library across that was across the street from my workplace and spend some time like jotting down in my little notebooks of like this ideas. Um, sometimes with the scene, sometimes with me outlining a scene. It was or just brainstorming stuff. So I'd be, have basically a list of things to be to to take care of when I write at, at night and. 
And I said, basically, I think for when I'm drafting, I said, like, you know, I said, like, a goal for, like, weeknights, 2,000 words, um, weekends, uh, I think it was 5,000 for each for each week, for like, Saturday and Sunday each, and just did that for his first drafts, and it's a little bit, it's, far, it's fast and loose when, when revision, which is the longer part, but it just, it's just mostly allotting those certain hours, and just having the vision of, like, you know, riding at night, and spending as much as time as I can on the weekends, even though I do spend, I do... I think I also I also make allowances for myself to take certain breaks because I'm working all day that I'm basically spending on my free time mm-hmm. writing, working in a sense. I know in the past, I had a lot of my vacation time recently is like, you know, I'd spend time working my book, basically like people, I go to, especially I got, I got, I got a journalist, my job is generous with the vacation time you do give us. So a lot of times I had, I would like, you know, I basically, I would be taking, I would be taking off time from work, but it'd be like, I'm not, I'm not taking, I'm still working and stuff, but just learning that make, make some, making some time for myself between all, everything is all part of the balancing things. And I haven't gotten to point I need to schedule that yet, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, just figuring out, just figuring out what works for me. And, and also I'm less lucky. I don't have too many people. I only have me to take care of. So that, that helps mm-hmm. a lot as well for my, mm-hmm. my just balancing everything out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, Matthew's back with another question. Um, uh, does your experience as a UX researcher make you think about the interactions between your characters and the world in a different way? It's, I don't know if it makes it different. I think I, I, I got into UX research because I was a psych major. And it's UX research is kind of this, is that take it looking at the idea of products and ideas and design and kind of how, how things work, basically how things make it easy. Make it easy. So I don't know. I think because I always had these interests as long as I was writing, I don't think it changed differently. But I think I guess the skill set I learned, I guess from researching and cross checking stuff, kind of helped. I guess when I'm doing the research aspect of it, doing the craft side of writing in that sense. But I, know, I guess it, I guess it's always. I feel like it's as it's entwined with me for so long. It's it's really hard to say if it's changed too much. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's hard to say. Okay, uh, and uh, let's see. Was there was there a scene? Uh, was there a scene or a section of the book that brought you the most joy to to write? Um, there was a. It's kind of funny. There was a scene I had. Um, it was in the middle of the book. It's a. They went to like a kind of a carnival in a sense, of like an excursion. And oh yeah, right. It was a lot of fun. It was. It was just, it was fun on some levels because it was like a nice little break. They did a lot of there was a lot of mystery solving, a lot of like mm-hmm. heavy stuff earlier. So it was a nice little break, but at the same time, I'm like balancing. I think I, I realized I have like I have all the subplots, all the main plots intertwined in this chapter, and it was really fun for me to, on, the, on the craft level to think, oh, I have all this stuff going on at the same time. But still, it's still like the lighthearted, like it's still like a lighthearted sense for to become some good character work. So that was a lot of fun to kind of revisit and. And that's one of the things that one of those things that the sections that kind of came organically as as I developed the stuff. I don't, I don't think it was expanded out when I to my first draft. And as I as I gotten more into the book, it's like, oh, this needs to be a bit more because it's like a a way to tackle all these different plot lines together at the same time, but not seem like I'm doing it the same at the same time. So I that was one of those things I really liked writing about as a, a certain part of the book specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Matthew, our, our friend, uh, our co-moderator Matthew, uh, thank you, Matthew, for all uh, your wonderful questions. Uh, he says, um, "I love the cover. Was this the first one that you saw, or were there other iterations?" I don't actually Absolutely. remember the answer, but that, I think that was that was it, right? Yeah, it's the only. I think I think there's might have been some minor tweaks, but that yeah. was more or less what it was. It was yeah. what it is. Yeah, I think I think we uh, tweaked uh, her her little collar. Right, mm-hmm. like, um, which actually I think that was a really interesting uh, touch in the book too, where where mm-hmm. Hedy uh, would uh, uh, sew the different magical uh, sort of mm-hmm. wards into the into the um, the choker uh, that she wears mm-hmm. around her neck. Um, so I thought that was really cool. But yeah, I think that was like one thing that we had to add to the I- illustration because it, it uh, either it wasn't right or maybe it wasn't there in the first place. I can't mm-hmm. remember, but yeah. So, um, yeah. but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it turned out pretty great, right? I mean, it's uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, okay. So Vina wants to know what can we look forward to in book two. Oh, that's a funny. Well, it's pretty much another. Uh, I guess the, from the big picture view, another adventure, more mystery stuff. I get some more. Yes, you know, more fun stuff for me to kind of dive into deeper into certain uh, kind of. It's 
yeah, it's another adventure basically. It's not I like to I each I like to view each mystery as like as a standalone thing. So there's like connections with the first book, but not not strong enough. But it's like not strong enough as like a series wise. But you know, it's more basically it's more more another mystery, more more fun stuff, more interesting side characters, get to see more friends, see different just get to, get to it's more of the like we kind of relax and have more fun with certain things. But yeah, more more magic, more stuff, more more little things that interest me that uh, different different plot lines are in there and stuff. But yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but this yeah. yeah, is one of the days it's like another adventure, more fun stuff. More. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what is the next project you're working on? Do you know what it is yet? Or I know, I mean, we just wrapped The Undertaker's not that long ago. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you already have the next thing in mind. Oh, this I got some. I got some one thing that haven't been. It hasn't been announced yet. That I mean, it's mm -hmm. been working on. That I'm excited about. And I know it's always different projects in, in my future. I've always had a zillion ideas. Which, mm -hmm. especially when I'm busy, when I'm posing on deadlines, when I'm busy with stuff, I have a zillion ideas that pop up. I think I had like an idea last week about stuff, and I was like, I don't have time for all these ideas. So I just started making notes of certain things I want to get into. And I think it's the funny thing about this. I guess writing is that you always when you get busy with a the project, there's always like like five other ideas you want to work on at the same time. And so it's more just shuffling things around, but you know, it's, I always have ideas to work on. So I think it's, I think it's kind of, it's always, I've always something to look forward to and hopefully I get to share them one day. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have uh, one more from Mysterious Galaxy saying, uh, was there anything in particular about the time period that present, uh, that presented challenges for the world building? Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of times it's just minor stuff. It's just, you know, like uh, basically like things like a thumbtacks not being invented on time or like, you know, event little inventions that we think are like commonplace. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I look it up and it's like, oh, this is like 10 years from now from the time period instead or like, you know, it's not exactly or uh, basically or how close I wanted to be with mm -hmm. big stuff. Because I think, for example, uh, one of the characters, Melody, was supposed to have been like a, I was originally had the idea of her being like a famous singer from like the fifth Jubilee singer group. And I found that like the singer group didn't really get established and well known until several years after them in the book set. And I was like, that doesn't quite work. And while I can make up a group or make up something different, I just didn't, it didn't feel right. And there's like little things like that. I guess it's more of me, even though the book has magic in it, it's with me deciding how close I want to stick to historical stuff. And when did I decide like to, to forget about it? And like, you know, just kind of say, I could just, there's magic, maybe technology is like a few years advanced. Right, right. By certain that, things. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's more of me picking and choosing like what fits and certain things and what works and what I care about not not being accurate. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, how did you even, uh, how did you even notice that thumbtacks weren't around there? Did you actually stop and like look them up? Yeah. You did look it yeah, up. That's okay, what wow. That's what I, wow. a classic, classic yeah. writers move. I looked it up. I looked yeah. it up. I mean, like anything, like, you know. Right. I looked up anything that I might like. You're thinking it might not be exactly. So I just right. looked it up, spent a few minutes. Sometimes I went down Google rabbit holes, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I just I just checked for certain stuff and like, oh, it's not exactly right. Right. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's decided. Right. Yeah, you know, I was gonna say there's there's certain things that you can think. Oh, well, sure, you would look that up because obviously you yeah. want to make sure that that's there. But there's some things like you know that you think like, oh no, you just assume like that's oh yeah fine that's that yeah. must have been around forever so uh yeah um oh oh yeah and i actually see matthew also saying in the chat there it's like yeah they seem like they're eternal <laughs> so yeah. yeah it is kind of funny that you actually thought to look it up so good for you mm -hmm. uh, all right well um i mean i think we're uh basically out of time here um mm -hmm. and uh so i'll turn it back over to our uh store moderator to wrap us up here uh yeah i'm back Thank you both for such a wonderful event. Um, there are like a couple of us in the Mysterious Galaxy account right now, but all of my comments are the ones about how much I love American Girl Doll <laughs> and Dear America because I read them again and again and again. Yes. <laughs> they were my favorite thing. Mm. Um, and just historical fiction in general. So I always love hearing how historical fiction gets kind of built in these new ways and it's fun to listen to. So thank you, Nicole, and thank you, John, for such a wonderful event. It was a great conversation. Um, thank you to all of our audience members for their great questions and for the love that they've shown in the chat, excuse me. Um, but other than that, I will let you go on your merry Thursday night way. And again, if you need to find 
a copy of the conductors and would like to order a personalized book, you can use the link below. And you know, this is our virtual round of applause. So thank <laughs> you, Nicole, and thank you, John. And hopefully we'll see you again soon for the next book. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.